This VAP focuses on how to assess vertical growth in a child and specifically how to approach a child with short stature. The aim is for you to learn how to think critically and clinically about how a child grows and the possible factors that may be contributing to poor growth. You will learn 1. The important questions to ask in the history 2. The key physical signs to look for in the physical exam 3. How to plot a growth chart effectively 4. What investigations should be considered and 5. What management strategies are available Every child is expected to grow physically taller with age until they reach adulthood. Normal growth follows a normal distribution curve, which therefore gives us an accepted range of heights that would be considered normal for the population. Growth is a dynamic process that is dependent on many different factors that will be discussed later. So when you are assessing a child's height growth, several questions need to be considered preliminarily. First, is the child truly short? How to reach the answer to this question will be discussed in due course. Secondly, is there an underlying cause? This will guide your decision on investigations as well as management. Thirdly, what will be the predicted adult height achieved without intervention? And finally, is there anything that needs to be done to improve this child's growth? Before you can proceed with taking a useful history and performing an effective physical examination, you need to first be aware of the differential diagnoses for short stature. This diagram shows that broadly speaking, there are six main factors that determine what the final adult height of any individual will be, though there may be some overlap. Nutrition impacts growth directly. Problems with nutrition may involve inadequate quantity, inappropriate quality, inability to absorb or utilize the calories, or excessive losses. Genetic factors to be considered in a growth assessment include familial short stature, constitutional delay of growth, congenital problems, and genetic abnormalities. Endocrine factors include growth hormone deficiency or resistance, thyroid problems, abnormal puberty, adrenal problems, and other hypothalamic pituitary axis problems. Bone factors include skeletal dysplasias, as well as problems affecting bone mineral content, which include inadequate substrate, abnormal structure or mineral content, and excessive bone breakdown. Psychosocial factors also play a very large part in determining if a child grows to his or her full potential. And the presence of any significant chronic disease will understandably have an adverse impact on a child's ability to grow. When taking the history, you need to ask about the onset of the concerns about the child's growth. In other words, has this child always been small since birth and possibly even in utero? Or has something happened more recently to affect the child's growth at a later stage? The health booklet can often provide many details, including birth details and height and weight measurements over time. When taking a dietary history, it is more effective to take a 24-hour food diary than to ask the parent if the child eats well subjectively. However, bear in mind that feeding issues are extremely common in the younger children and may be contributing to the problem. A complete history is important, including past medical history, looking for evidence of chronic disease, drug history, looking for drugs or even traditional medicines that may be affecting the child's growth, such as steroids or high doses of Ritalin, family history to assess genetic potential as well as inherited problems, birth history for obvious antenatal or postnatal problems, and social history looking for psychosocial factors. A review of systems is also vital, as this may be the only clue you get that there is an underlying pathology. For example, headache and vomiting may suggest an intracranial pathology which may be affecting growth hormone production. Likewise, a systematic full physical examination is required. On inspection, you must look for dysmorphic features suggesting an underlying syndrome or genetic abnormality, such as Turner syndrome, Prader-Willi, Russell Silver, etc. You will need to calculate a child's body segment ratio 
as this would give a clue as to diseases which would affect the spine, such as skeletal dysplasia, or diseases which affect limb growth, such as rickets. The upper segment is measured from the vertex of the head to the pubic symphysis. The lower segment ratio is measured from the pubic symphysis to the sole of the foot. The average ratio is 1.7 is to 1 at birth, but would decrease to 1 is to 1 when the child hits 10 years of age. It is also important to examine the genitals as delayed puberty may suggest constitutional growth delay, especially if the family history also corresponds. For example, mothers with late menarche and fathers having growth spurts later than their peers. Tanner staging is used as a classification tool to track the development and sequence of secondary sex characteristics of children during puberty. Measuring penile length and determining testicular volume with an ochidometer is also important in boys. Looking also for any stigmata of chronic disease is vital. Examining all the specific symptoms is necessary to look for evidence of underlying pathology. For example, cardiac abnormalities may contribute directly to poor growth or may be associated with a genetic syndrome that is known to have short stature as a feature. And performing a CNS exam including visual fields may reveal a space-occupying lesion. Assessing the body proportions and obtaining accurate height measurements is pivotal. This can point to a skeletal dysplasia. And several measurements over time will give you an indication of height velocity, which can also be plotted against age. Once you have obtained accurate anthropomorphic measurements, you need to enter the details on the relevant growth charts, which must include height for age, weight for age, and height velocity for age charts, and hit circumference for age as well in a younger child. There are gender-specific growth charts, and growth charts specific for various conditions, such as Turner syndrome. There are also charts which include local normative values. It is necessary to also calculate the gender-specific mid-parental height, as well as the target centile range, which is defined by values plus or minus one standard deviation from the mid-parental height. For example, if the patient is a boy, mid-parental height may be calculated by averaging his father's height and the mother's masculinized height, i.e. by adding 13 centimeters to her actual height. The target centile range is plus or minus 6.5 centimeters from the calculated mid-parental height. If the patient is a girl, then 13 centimeters must be deducted from the father's height before averaging it with her mother's height. This is an example of a growth chart for girls aged 2 years to 20 years, showing the girl's height plotted serially over time, as well as her mid-parental height plus or minus one standard deviation. You can therefore extrapolate from this target centile range and determine if this child is growing within her genetic potential or not. A child who has familial short stature would have a height near or below the third percentile, but normal for the genetic potential of the family. This next chart shows height velocity over time, and that can be compared with the norms provided. So in this chart, the patient's growth velocity at age of 5 years was less than the third percentile for her age, which is abnormally slow and needs to be addressed. Once you have determined that she is indeed underperforming her expected target centile range and her height velocity is less than the third percentile for age, you have clearly identified that she does indeed have a problem with vertical growth. This brings you to consider what investigations you need to do to evaluate her further. There are innumerable investigations that can be performed for a child with growth difficulties. But the main ones to consider, even in the absence of specific symptoms or signs, would include thyroid function, insulin-like growth factor 1 level, X-ray bone age, MRI pituitary, and possibly a glucagon stimulation test, which looks at the patient's ability to produce growth hormone in response to hypoglycemia which would allow identification of growth hormone deficiency. Other tests should be performed if clinically indicated by features in the history and examination. 
Once you have performed the necessary investigations, if any, then a management plan is needed. If there is a specific pathology that needs to be addressed, then the management must deal with that. In the absence of abnormal results, it is also vital to discuss with the parents their expectations as well as to attempt to optimize the child's requirements for growth, such as adequate and appropriate nutrition, enough sleep and exercise. Growth hormone therapy can be considered in the following conditions. Growth hormone deficiency, Turner syndrome, chronic renal insufficiency, small for gestational age or intrauterine growth restriction, Prader-Willi syndrome, idiopathic short stature. While these indications are FDA approved, there are also other conditions that have been treated with growth hormone. In conclusion, whenever evaluating a child for short stature, it is important to keep these in mind. Height is relative to the population and to the child's parents. Plotting and interpreting growth charts accurately is vital. Growth is a dynamic and multifactorial process. Therapy for short stature involves treating any underlying conditions, optimizing growth requirements, and possibly growth hormone therapy. Quiz time. Which condition is growth hormone therapy not considered for? The answer is A. Skeletal dysplasia. Question 2. What are some investigations that can be done for a child with growth difficulties? The answer is E. All of the above.